My name is Monk Rowe. We are filming for the Hamilton College Jazz Archive in Los Angeles. And this is a real pleasure for me to welcome the man with the meanest alto sound this side of Marshall Royal, uh -oh. Lanny Morgan. <laughs> welcome. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for having me. It's nice yeah. to be here. I recall <coughs> hearing your sound uh, you know, on albums dating quite a while back, so this is a pleasure. Well, not too far now. Not too far, no. 1980. <laughs> <laughs> no, the first, first recording I ever did was 1953 with the uh -huh. L.A. City College Jazz Band. We mm -hmm. just won the, the Metronome. Remember that magazine? Sure. You probably don't remember it, but yeah. I know you've heard it. I remember the it. name, yeah. We won the, they had a contest for the best college jazz dance band, mm -hmm. and uh, we won it. Sometimes I'm not sure why, because uh, Dave Baker, who's since become a very close friend of mine, his band was in it from Indiana, and it was a wonderful band. Ours was more like a like a prom night band compared to that. But, oh. but we did win it. We, co we recorded four sides for uh, Capitol Records. Wow. We used to call them sides in those days. Yes. <laughs> it, were, they weren't, uh, well, LPs were. So you had how many? Total of eight songs or something? Uh, no, four. No, these Which weren't even LPs. This is before. These were 70, 78s. Wow. They were, we, we, it actually, it amounted to two 78s on mm -hmm. one tune on each side. Yeah. They it really were sides. Yes, yes, yes that's were. right. That's right, exactly. Were you guys playing like uh, really high powered Kenton type arrangements at that point? Well, it was, uh, it, with that band, you mean? Yeah. Um, it was, it was a, actually, it was the first lab band, really. Uh, I, I would say, except you couldn't get a, a degree in that kind of music at the school. But it was the oh. first band that had s played student arrangements, and uh, they had a recording studio, uh, like a radio studio. It was called the Radio and Recording Orchestra, or band. And uh, Bob McDonald, who since passed away, uh, led that band, and uh, he brought it, would bring in ringers from town, you know, to help us uh, out mm -hmm. and to show us how they should be they should be played and he also had charts by uh, you know some out of Stan's book and Woody's book and so forth and it was really it was really a good experience yeah everybody wanted to be in it I mean a lot of people that uh, you know from this town came out of that band you started on the violin yes I did uh-huh where do you get your information oh I have my sources <laughs> I started violin when I was six years old uh-huh my uh, my dad was a clarinet, was a saxophone player in Des Moines, Iowa. Uh, he uh, he traveled around the Midwest with the band, and he also had the staff band at WHO. And this is when Ronald Reagan was the oh. Dutch Reagan was the uh, sportscaster. I'll and my there. dad, who loved him immensely, said he didn't know anything about sports either. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> anyway. Um, at least he was consistent. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> he was. Just proves that a bad actor can be a bad president. Well, yeah. I should well, say. Whatever. But uh, anyway, um, my mother didn't want him to bring his horns home because it was sort of during the Depression and there was a lot of carousing and, you know, drinking and wild women going on and she wanted her little boy to, ah. to be something better than that. So he, he uh, complied with her wishes. He never brought his horns home and practiced. And, but in the sixth grade, I came home with a violin, and so it started, uh -huh. it started then. I was into it. But you were aware that he didn't, did he play full-time? Yeah. He played full-time, wow, and, and plus he had the radio gig. Yeah, and then he, uh, they played a lot of, uh, all the, there were places like the Kit Kat Club and the Belvedere Club, and they were like sort of jazz places. And, and later on, after that, the violin episode, uh, he would, they would take me to hear the band rehearse and things. So, uh -huh. so uh, actually it was a very, uh, you know, it was a very fruitful time for music because the pop stations were playing, uh, you know, all the all the heavy bands. I mean, uh, uh, you know, Benny Goodman, Tommy Dorsey, Basie, yeah. Duke—they were all on what would be the rock and roll channels yeah. now. So it was great, great experience to hear that. That was popular music. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And his band was—was uh, was it a big band or was it a, a combo of sort? No, it was three saxes. Uh, just three saxes, a trombone, and three trumpets, mm -hmm. and three rhythm. And uh, my uncle played saxophone in that band too, so I sort of had. Uh, they there were all my, my heroes, all those people. Yeah. So the violin didn't last too long. Well, it lasted uh, 16 years. I oh, played. all right. But I uh, I started what six years old. I guess it was in the, just started the first grade, but. Uh, when I was in high school, about the 11th grade, I, 
uh, there used to be a, a DJ out here named Gene Norman, who's since become a record producer, and mm -hmm. he had a show called The East Side Show, and it was all jazz, and of course that's the time that uh, uh, the, the coast has always been big with Stan Kenton and Woody Herman, because they were out here a lot of the time, but uh, in addition to hearing that, uh, Shorty had left Stan's band, and so I heard all of Shorty Rogers and the Giants and all those things, and he was playing uh, all of Miles Davis things, the versus the cool, and and uh, all of Bebop from New York, he would play the, with the older, you know, Fats Navarro and uh, Howard McGee, and of course Bird and Monk and all those people. Mm -hmm. um, so it really, uh, I I found myself uh, walking to my violin lesson, whistling Groovin' High and uh, Scrapple from the Apple. And so <laughs> the violin didn't last too much long yeah. after that. I, I had uh, picked up the clarinet in uh, junior high school. My dad gave me about a year's worth of lessons. Um, and uh, so I, I was in the, when I got to high school, I was in the concert band, the marching band on clarinet and the orchestra on violin. But as time went on, then I picked up the alto in the 12th grade, just before I got out of high school. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the violin began to go down the tubes after yeah. that. Yeah. Did you have any aspirations uh, of being a professional musician when, as a senior in high school? Uh, at the very end, I did, because uh, actually I had a math science major all through school, and I was going to be a doctor, but uh, that didn't really go too well, really. I wasn't, uh, it, it really just didn't appeal to me that much, the, co the classes or the, the prospect of being in, in medicine, really. So uh, I was in all the, in the all city and all state orchestras out here on on the violin, and they used to rehearse at City College, and uh, we would get there sometimes, and Bob McDonald, who I didn't know then, would uh, keep uh, maybe the sax section or the brass section from his radio and recording orchestra over for a little section rehearsal, so we had to wait for them to get through. And uh, one day I heard this, the sax, he had kept the sax section open, and I heard that, and it just blew me away, and that was it. Mm -hmm. And I kept up the violin for a little while, but uh, <laughs> kept up the pretense, I guess. Yeah. But. Uh, I mean, you know, after all that, I'd, actually I was a pretty good fiddle player. I'd gone through all the literature, never played professionally, but uh, it, was a, it was a little difficult to give it up, but the other, the pull was so strong from the, what was called bebop at that time that yeah. uh, I couldn't fight it. D did your whole family come out to Los Angeles? My, uh, I came out with my mother uh -huh. in 1944 who told me we were going out for a vacation, knowing that we were moving out here. Ah, this was a dirty trick. I see. And, uh, my dad was on the road back there for a while, and that really sort of didn't pan out because they, he joined us later, but they separated soon after, uh -huh. eventually getting back together. But uh, So it was just my mother and I, and uh, her mother lived out here, and then eventually the whole clan moved out here, maybe about three or four years later. Yeah. How did she feel about your direction you were going in as far as being a, in, in essence, uh, following your father's path? Is that the way she looked at it? Maybe I'm assuming. Well, I, th I think that, you know, times were a little different then. I, I did do my share of drinking and whatever else goes with the business, but, you know, the depression, I think, was was kind of a uh, really a hard time for people and and uh, you know you not only you, you not only had uh, like not an awful lot of work but there was a lot of uh, you know a lot of bootlegging and mm -hmm. things like that a lot of a lot of hoods were around and it was just really a wild time all over and if you were in the, the entertainment business it was I would imagine that it was really just like some of the movies you see you know it was mm -hmm. really kind of kind of difficult to deal with if you were uh, the spouse of somebody who was doing that and waiting for him to come home and sometimes they did and sometimes they didn't. But uh, my life was a little more structured and I always tried to keep that in mind that, uh -huh. that I would really rather do something than fall off the ship in the middle of the ocean. Yeah. And she saw it was serious too because I took, I, you know, when I went to City College I took not only uh, not only the band, but I was in the orchestra, I was in the woodwind, a couple of woodwind groups, and I took harmony and counterpoint and, and arranging and things So like it was that. a more uh, serious schooled approach that maybe she could relate to and feel. That my father had, yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. 
Charlie Barnett first, uh, was that your first, let's yes, say, name that was, thing? that was very short. That was three weeks. Oh. Uh, but he was my first name band affiliation, and uh, it was, uh, there was one chair open on that band, and a friend of mine said, uh, why don't you try and go on this tour with us? It'll be a start, and you meet some people and so forth. So it was the fourth tenor chair, and uh, I bought a tenor. And I didn't, uh, I've never had an affinity for the tenor. I've never even taken the time to find a decent mouthpiece until mm -hmm. uh, a few years ago. And then my tenor got run over by a TWA baggage cart, and that was the end of that. And, Ouch. and that was the more, actually, it was a tenor that Willie Maiden, who was on Maiden's band with oh. me, had, had willed to me. And it was, a, it was a vintage Mark VI. And I still have it, and one day we'll get it fixed. But uh, I don't like to play tenor, uh, but I did in that band. Uh, there was, Probably nobody that you would know. On, well, maybe there was. Gary Frommer played drums, who later uh, played with Art Pepper and Chet Baker, a uh, bass player named Don Payne, who went on to do some, moved to New York and went on to do some uh, Brazilian type things. Um, there was a tenor player, wonderful tenor player named Charlie Deramol, who uh, had taken Ted Nash's place with the original Billy May band. Mm -hmm. And he was a monster. And he later, for some reason, uh, switched to alto for a while and played lead with Stan Kenton's band, uh, which I still can't understand, but uh, I don't think there's anybody else that you would know there. Uh -huh. But it was it was just a three-week thing, and a, and a piano player named Ike Carpenter, who you may have heard of, uh, who had a band, uh, a real screaming band out here for a lot of years, um, was played piano on Charlie's band, and at the end of the three weeks, Charlie took sort of the nucleus, or the guys that wanted to go, of, of that band up to Lake Tahoe. And uh, we stayed there for the summer, for three months, uh, at the Calvada, which was right up from the Cal Neva. I don't know if you're familiar with, with Lake Tahoe or not. But, but that was a nice little gig. It only paid uh, $120 a week. Yeah. <laughs> and you had to pay for your own lodgings and oh food. Oh, boy. But uh, so the only thing that happened from that, for, uh, rewarding for me, was that I uh, I found a dentist up there and got had all the work done on my teeth, <laughs> and uh, and I came home with uh, oh I don't know 115 dollars yeah. I guess. Well, you got a you got a little taste of it, you know, big band. Yeah. You were you were what 20 years old and 20 years old, and we also played behind. Uh, you know, Nat Cole came in for three weeks, mm -hmm. uh, Mel Torme, uh, and we backed them up and we got to know them pretty well. And uh, you know, I mean, just playing behind Nat for three weeks was worth the whole summer actually mm -hmm. for me. And some acts that were not so enduring, like Gogi Grant, maybe, and uh, uh, people of that uh -huh. good, but you know, not the uh -huh. not the kind that are going to last forever. So, so at least you decided. Well, I, I am going to still pursue this. It didn't didn't knock you out of the the thought of doing it. No, because I did meet people, and there were plans. You know, you meet somebody, and and they. Oh, I'm sure you know how that is too. People say, hey, you know, yeah. so and so is going out in uh, two weeks, and it was mostly all road work at that time because I. You know, the studios at that time were, uh, weren't really employing doublers, not many doublers, if any. They were all straight flute players, straight oboe players, straight this player and so forth, and they were all on staff, Paramount and MGM and 20th Century. So um, there was no, not even any thought of that. So it was all, you know, there were maybe 40, 45 bands in this country that you could think about going with the Dorseys and, and uh, Benny Goodman and... Yeah, e wow, even... Uh, I guess I have this fairly misconstrued idea that uh, the big bands almost pff, like disappeared in the in the latter 40s. No, I think they... they weren't as hot as they were. Uh -huh. But uh, I think the big bands didn't... well. Let me put, I think they were really almost over in the, at the end of the 50s. But um, because, you know, the, both Dorsey's, Dorsey's were alive then. Mm -hmm. uh, Benny was still alive then. Uh, even the, you know, the bands like uh, Henry Bussey and bands that people really didn't want to go out with, but they would to get road, road experience. Uh -huh. But uh, uh, when I was on Maynard's band in the 60s, first half of the 60s, uh, we used to play dances, and they were, it was standing room only. And there were a lot of kids, too, which mm. was amazing. I wish it was that way today. Yes. Did the, um, the prospect of the draft uh, frighten you? 
Well, it did. Uh, actually, I'll take a minute and a half and tell you this story. I, I was uh, trying to think of this, the time frame. Uh, I went to City College, and I, uh, I went to City College actually because I wanted to go to City College, but, but probably uh, a lesser reason was that the Korean War was going on then, too, uh -huh. and I really didn't want to go for that. So uh, I couldn't just go to City College and take music. You had to take, uh, prepare for a teacher's credential to make it legitimate. So uh, to do that, I had to take a lot of subjects that I had, had a belly full of in high school, like uh, English and sciences and history and, and things that really didn't interest me at all. But I did it uh, because, uh, well, because I wanted that education because I really didn't want to go to Korea. Mm -hmm. So, but my grades were so bad in the, in the academic <laughs> subjects that they finally flunked me out. And I went on the road in 1954 and just stayed out of school and, and figured I'd take my chances. Uh, and then I got a call from Bill Perkins in San Francisco. He was on Stan's band then, and he said, would you like to come on the band? Lenny Niehaus is going to leave. And I said, I'd love to, because that's the band that uh, Willis, that Bill Holman was writing for. Yeah. You know, and I just I ate and, sl and slept that band. You know, uh -huh. it, was, uh, uh, it was a wonderful band. And uh, I said, yes. And he said, well, he said, just sit tight. It shouldn't be too long. Well, he called in another uh, month and said Lenny's decided to stay for a while. In the meantime, I had to make some money, so I joined Frankie Carl's band. You mm -hmm. remember that band? Yeah. Well, there was a three-month tour with that band through the, mostly the Southwest. And uh, I went on that tour, and we were playing Texas A&M, and a cadet came up with a note from my parents, and it said, Lenny, call home regarding induction notice. Ouch. So they gave me a couple months to, to finish the tour and settle my affairs, and then I... Uh, mm -hmm. I went in the Army for, uh, from, I think, March uh, 57, and then I got out New Year's Eve, 1958. So it took a big chunk uh, out, which I regretted. I mean, I think something could have happened to my career faster mm -hmm. had, it, had I had that opportunity and not been. And you know, I, I, but actually my time in the service was uh, mostly in Europe with the 7th Army Symphony. and. Uh, we played a couple soldier show companies or uh, shows, which are like uh, Broadway shows that they send around to the different uh, concerns they call them in in Germany. And then uh, we had a jazz show, an eighteen-piece jazz band that did six months over there. And that band, you know, I couldn't have been any more fortunate. It had it was uh, my along with myself was Eddie Harris and Leo Wright and Don Ellis and uh, Cedar Walton. Uh, so it was really playing with good musicians. Uh, and also the outside playing. We used to go to Heidelberg and play at the Cave, was a jazz joint mm -hmm. there. And, uh, and then I played with the symphony, too. We did Porgy and Bess and uh, another Gershwin thing. So it wasn't time wasted. It was just, uh, it was just uh, dead time as far as what I Yeah, you're off the scene. Really want, yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. Why didn't I think of that? You said it in three words, and I. <laughs> <laughs> oh. uh, the. The Ferguson Band was seemed to be one of the hottest things going. That was a 13 pieces, or 13, 14. 13 pieces. Yeah. Well, I think it was. I may be a little prejudiced now. I, I think I think uh, at times during that band's that particular band's lifetime, which was probably 1957 through uh, when he left New York, uh, which was early '66. I think that band was maybe four or five times that band was uh, nobody could touch it. It was the hottest band in the world, and I'm including everybody. Mm -hmm. um, it, actually, I played with that band in 1957, just before I went in the service. Willie Maiden was an old friend of mine, and uh, he was playing baritone on the band, and and uh, he got sick one night. They were playing at a place called Peacock Lane in L.A. This is when L.A. had jazz places, and. Uh, yeah. So I went up and, and subbed for him for two nights. And then uh, when I got out, Jimmy Ford was on the band. Uh, Jimmy who, uh, later became a very good friend of mine, but, but he left the band. Uh, well, I spent a year in LA, and then I got a call from Willie uh, in March 1960 and said that Jimmy uh, was leaving and would I want to join the band. And I really did have to think about it a little bit because I was starting to do a little studio work out here and, and doing some pretty good gigs. I was recording with 
Cy Zentner's van. I was working a lot with the new Terry Gibbs van mm -hmm. and uh, some other people. But it, so it took me about three or four days, and I called him back and and moved back. And you know, I was the day I got there, we had a rehearsal at a place called Lynn Oliver's, 89th and Broadway. And I was staying with Willie Maiden, and we came home from the rehearsal, and. Uh, my dad called and said, Lanny Stan wants you to come on the band. Get out. So, I'm serious. So, and I couldn't do it because I, you know, I'd moved. <laughs> uh, I mean, I'd like to say Lock, Stock, and Barrel to New York. I, I didn't have that much then. I was, I was 20, well, I was right around my 26th birthday. And, uh, but I had, uh, you know, canceled everything out there and moved to New York. And, and then he wanted me to come on the band. And, and uh, so I had to turn him down. So it was really, it was really a drag, drag. But the band then, I, you know, I have to say that I did the right thing because talking about Maynard's band again, I think Stan's band never, never really achieved uh, what it once was. Maybe after 1957, I don't think it was ever that again. And and Maynard's band was on the rise, and it was a hot band, and it just kept getting better and better mm -hmm. and better. And a lot, so many guys went through that band. That, you know, the saxes when I joined were Frank Hitton was playing baritone and Joe Farrell was playing tenor and Willie and myself and Slide Hampton was on the band quite a bit off and on. Jackie Byard. Um, and then a lot of other guys came through the band too at different times. But it was it was really a, a wonderful were, band. Were you in the uh, there when, when Don Menza came through? Yeah, Don okay. replaced Joe Farrell. Uh huh. It was it was Joe and then Menza and then uh, Frank Vicari was the third tenor player, and, that's, mm -hmm. and the band broke up, not because of that, but shortly after uh -huh. that. What was the travel situation like, the road? You know, were you, was it a tough grind in those days? Uh, yes. Looking back at it, you forget all those things, you know, yeah. but it was a wonderful experience, but I wouldn't want to do it again. Uh, yeah, because we had, uh, we didn't have a bus, we had station wagons. and. Uh, Starting salary on that band was 120 a week. I made 135 because I was not only the lead alto player, but played a lot of jazz too, mm -hmm. and because he'd know me, you know. And so, 135 a week, and and he had two station wagons, and then he drove himself. He had a two Jaguars, a Mark 9, that never ran more than three or four blocks at a time, and uh, that little white XKE or the predecessor to the XKE, uh -huh. I guess. But uh, uh, I. I wound up driving one of the station wagons, and uh, a friend of mine from Maine, Don Doan, uh, wound up driving, driving the other one. And uh, it, it, well, you can imagine if you know you leave, you have a one nighter in Chicago. I just found a pay receipt for this the other night. It was for twenty-three dollars and sixty-five cents, a one nighter in Chicago. Now, out of that, tax was taken, so you get about nineteen dollars. Out of that, you have to pay uh, uh, for your own lodging. And for food, so we used to stay at the Croydon Hotel in Chicago. That was like two fifty a night. Another fifty cents if you wanted a black and white TV, uh, and say another six dollars for food, maybe. So in other words, you're coming home with eleven dollars, eleven eleven fifty. So I took the driving job because we got one cent a mile. When our Chicago is nine hundred and nine hundred and. 60 miles, I think it is. So I would come home with an extra 18, 19, a little over $19, plus my 11 would be 30 bucks I would have. See. Yeah. And Gee, that uh, was like an extra night of work. That's right. <laughs> we, when I joined that band, we, we, uh, we rehearsed that day, the day I got back there. Uh, had a, and the next day, we opened at Birdland. And we opened for some reason. It seems like we played there for three weeks. Birdland usually booked people for uh, two weeks, but this was three weeks. <coughs> Excuse me. And it was opposite uh, Art Blakey, uh, the band with uh, Wayne Shorter and Lee Morgan and uh, uh, Curtis Fuller. Curtis Fuller, sounds right. Uh, good band. And uh, then we went right away. We had one day off and we went to the Brooklyn Paramount and we played there opposite the Jazz Tet, newly formed Jazz Tet, Art Farmer and Benny Golson. Benny Golson. And, uh, uh, and also, um, oh, another hot King Curtis was on there. Do you remember him? King Curtis was on that band. King, no, not on the band, but he, oh, he was there. Act. Yeah. I don't know if Jack McDuff was there or not, but th okay. I think they were together at that time. And that was another good show. That was for ten days. And then we had uh, about uh, four gigs on the road. Uh, 
Pennsylvania and uh, uh, yeah, around Philly, that area. And then, and I thought, this is wonderful. I'm, you know, what is that, like 135 times, uh, times five almost. I'm, I'm rolling. I was paying $155 a week for a, a place in, uh, at 85th and Broadway in Manhattan. And uh, I thought, this, you know, I've died and gone to heaven. Well, then we didn't work for a month and a half, see. And, oh. and nobody was on oh, retainer. Yeah, no. Nobody was on a retainer. Uh, everything was prorated when we did work. So uh, that, the reality set in there because uh, then I, I really went from uh, from wealthy to uh, poor in uh, in about five weeks. But the driving the driving was terrible. I'll be brief about this. I'm spending too much time with the driving, but uh, it was you know I've set out at like eight o'clock at night from uh, used to leave from Juniors or Charlie's Tavern in, at 52nd and Broadway to go to Chicago or or even Pittsburgh or someplace, uh, and it would be snowing so hard you couldn't see somebody standing. Mm -hmm. as close to me as you are uh, and have to drive all that way uh, and usually we'd, we'd try and catch the, we'd leave late so we could catch the day sheet which meant uh, you'd check in about six in the morning and you'd grab a few hours sleep and then you'd leave right after the gig and come back to, to New York to save money. Uh, I didn't quite follow the day sheet. Well the day sheet begins usually at uh, six or seven o'clock in the morning. In other words that's, the, that's that day. Talking about a, mo a hotel. Hotel. Okay. Yeah, uh, it's like this hotel ends. You know, they don't they don't want you to leave until say eleven or noon maybe. But but their sheet for new people checking in begins at probably seven or eight o'clock in the morning, uh, if they have any rooms available there. Oh, okay. Uh, so we would try and catch that and uh, and s and get a good day's sleep and and then leave after the job and, and drive all the way back to New York, which was difficult. You mean you you drove to Chicago for a one-nighter? Oh yeah, several times. I th boy, I thought the rock and roll business was. was <laughs> no, something. we did that. We did that quite a few times. Play, and, and Chicago and, and places <laughs> oh. like that. And 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 probably the um, the throughway system was the roads were a long way from where they are now. The too. throughways and the turnpikes were finished, but the interstates were not. And of course, we, even though we got reimbursed for tolls, uh, it took time to stop and go through the toll booths all the time. And when you're on a roll, you know, I, could, I couldn't drink during that period. I had to stay sober because <laughs> driving yeah. through, a, through a blizzard with these guys, it's, uh, but you, you just get on a roll and you want to go, it's kind of hypnotic, and I really shouldn't have done that, but uh, uh, we, we would try these new interstates, and they were a drag because, because you'd, uh, you'd take an interstate for... Oh, 100 miles, and you think, oh, this is wonderful. They were brand new roads and so forth. And then it would say end, end of interstate, oh. merge into one lane. So you come into one lane, and then it would take you probably an hour and a half to get back to a decent road oh. to the free, because they would, the interstates, you know, if you notice on the map, sometimes go way far off of the freeways or the throughways. So that part of it was the drag. And there were some places like uh, Cincinnati that it was almost impossible to get to. The, there were no ro no decent roads. There were like a lot of two two lane highways, uh, backwoods gas stations where you were almost afraid to stop. Sometimes uh, we had a couple we had a couple carloads of kids follow us into a gas station in West Virginia once, and they had chains. You know they were gonna they were gonna get us good. Fortunately, our car was newer and we got out of there fast. But oh man! But it was uh, there was a lot of that really. It was it was not uh, completely safe to to mm -hmm. be traveling, even with six guys in the car. Did you have a mixed, was that a mixed band? Yes. Black and white? Yeah. Did you ever have any trouble, well, you said down the... In well, we didn't have trouble, we just had to, uh, uh, we couldn't stay at the same hotels. I remember Richmond, Virginia, uh, Jackie Byron and Rufus Jones were on the band and we had to take them to, uh, to a colored hotel and then we came back to ours and then when we, uh, of course, they could eat there at their own hotel, but when we were traveling down south, uh, you had to go into a, like a diner and bring them something to go. And Chet Ferretti, who was uh, the lead trumpet player when I first joined the band, Italian, a dark-skinned Italian, and I was like a Southern California beach boy at that time. Even in New York, I found the beach right away and got a tan as much as I could. They wouldn't serve us in a, in a restaurant in, uh, I think it was either Delaware or Maryland, Maryland down the coast from New York, 
uh, because they said we were too dark. And I said, I have my license. I said, wait a minute. I said, look here, it says Caucasian. And uh, he said, I don't care what it says. It says, you ain't getting no food here. And it was a drive because we were getting food for, for the rest of the guys in the car too, see. So, so we just had to, had to keep going until we found some more hospitable people. Were you infuriated by that? Well, I, I was infuriated, and it's a little frightening sometimes, too, because you never know where it's going to come from. New, New York was, was so open and so integrated, uh, and California was, too. But, uh, you know, you get in the backwoods of some of these southern states, and at that time, the, in my opinion, the state troopers were just as bad as the, as the other people with their, you know, old cavalry, ha cavalry, ha mm -hmm. cavalry hats. Yes. And their uh, their boots up to here, and they were they were really hot shots, real rednecks. Mm -hmm. So if you got stopped, I mean they would stop you for no reason at all. We got stopped several times on that band for, just because there were mixed a mixed group in the car. Hi, we're the Maynard Ferguson band. That that yeah. that'd cut a lot of slack. Say what? Them, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> you the what? <laughs> but they didn't. Uh, we never, nothing ever happened to us down there except almost that incident with the kids and the chains. But um, once in Pennsylvania, coming home from, uh, oh, Pittsburgh, I think, or maybe even Chicago, because I was dead tired and I was driving, and the speed limit was 65, and I was, I was 65 right on the button. It didn't have cruise control, but I just had my foot right there and I hadn't budged for miles. And a state trooper pulled up next to me and, uh, and I just looked at him and kept driving because I wasn't breaking the law. Well, he eventually pulled me over and told me I was speeding. And I, I said, no, I wasn't. I've been going 65. And of course, you can't argue with those people. You know, he, he made everyone get out of the car. And everybody was half asleep or, or juiced or whatever. You know, it was kind of it was a strange. And I thought, here we go, boy. This will be 99 years in the electric chair for all of us. But. Uh, he let us go with a very stern warning, and we poured everybody back in the car and went back, and I went about 60 all the way home. Yeah. So. Well, you guys put some good stuff on on, on wax. Still. Yeah. No one was ever really happy about it. Uh, really? Was that, was too rushed? Well, was we, we thought it was, uh, I mean, the band, we always thought it was poorly recorded. Uh-huh. But uh, they sent me a... Uh, they sent me a uh, request for some comments on that uh, uh, mosaic yeah. CD, uh, uh, and I sent them to them, and, and uh, they sent me a set of them as payment, gratitude, whatever, uh, which I thought was wonderful. It's really, I don't know if they remastered those or not, but uh, mm -hmm. I thought it really came out very well. Yeah. Carmen Leggio was on that. Not with me. He was on before me. Before you. Yeah. 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 He was. But Carl was a good player. I was familiar with what he did. Mm-hmm. Um, that band was a lot of fun. You know, it was. It was. Uh, it was a very loose band. It, people used to accuse it of being loud and out of tune, but it really wasn't. It was. Uh, it had moments when it probably was, but most of the time it was. It was a pretty sensitive sensitive band and the guys all got along most of the time mm -hmm. uh, but it was it was something that I that I'm, I'm glad I did I don't know if I'd want to well I know I wouldn't want to repeat it at my age now but uh, yeah. but it was it was something that I'm, yeah. I'm glad I did could be a part of it you came back uh, was a conscious decision to come back and and get into studio work on your part or did it just kind of fall into it well I didn't really I didn't have a thought of ever coming back to Los Angeles. Uh, I, um, but you know, things had had fallen to almost zero in New York after Maynard left in 1966, and uh, I I had a little group with uh, Micah Benny and Ronnie McClure and Tony and Zalaco and a trumpet player named Dick Hurwitz, a little quintet, and we we made a demo had made a demo uh, earlier before the band broke up that I couldn't sell, and I still have it. It's a good demo, it really is. But, uh, you know, we took, I took it to Nestle Erdogan once on a cold winter's night, and he gave me this jive about uh, how the company didn't have any money, and 
and he would had his feet on his desk and was talking on the phone while he was listening to my platter. You know, it was like a mm -hmm. pancake. And stuff. Yeah. And then he said the company didn't have any money. In the next uh, couple of weeks, they released uh, some of the worst horse shit that I've ever heard uh -huh. in my life. But uh, that was my introduction to the record business. You know, you don't just you don't just bring them something good and say, "I'd like to have you do this," because there's more to it than that. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I, anyway, that fell through, and I was kind of discouraging. And then uh, I was doing some jingles in New York. Micah Benny had gotten into a, a little bit of the jingle end of it, writing for him, and he got me in on some of those. Uh, just a little bit of this and that, some record dates. Uh, I was working at a uh, supper club on in Mineola, Long Island, uh, that took out the slack. I mean, I had a deal there where if I wasn't working, I could always go in there and do it, and that was, that was good for three or four nights a week. Mm -hmm. uh, I had probably 30 private students, and I, ha I drove to their house, and that really broke my back. Wow. That was really difficult, and I think... This I think was in New York? In New York, on Long Island. Uh-huh. And I charged... Uh, um, I worked for a company, and they charged them $5, and out of that I got 350 oh. So, you know, I mean, what is that, 30 students? If I taught them all in a week, that was 30, that's 90, a little over 90, but almost a little less than $100, probably. Uh, and then I started to work the a gig at the Copacabana opened up, and I took that for about the last nine months I was uh, in New York. But you know, the, even the jazz thing uh, kind of folded, it seemed like. I I was on a band that Howard McGee put together for a couple of years, and we used to play festivals and uh, things. We rehearsed at that uh, church that the Reverend Genzel had uh, mm -hmm. on Fifth Avenue, was it, or Madison, or... I don't know. I just heard he died a, couple, a few months ago or uh -huh. last year. Yes. But uh, th there really wasn't anything there that was doing me any good uh, career-wise. And a friend of mine who I'd gone to school with, who was in that band at City College, named mm -hmm. Jules Chaikin, uh, called me. We had remained friends all those years. And he said, uh, how are you doing there? And I said, well, I'm doing fine. And he asked me what I was making, <laughs> just like that. And I said, <laughs> I said, well, I'm making, you know, uh, maybe... Six fifty a week, a good week, and he said, "Well, that's not bad." But he said, "You know, if you ever come, he said I can do better for you. If you're ever going to come back to California, he said, do it now." And he explained it to me, and so I, my then wife and I talked <laughs> talked it yeah. over, and uh, uh, I did go back out. And I tell you, I, I went back on uh, about the same time I left, almost nine years to the day, and in the remaining uh, uh, nine months of that year. I made probably more than I had in the last three years in New York, wow. uh, just doing studio things. Uh -huh. It was roaring out here then. It was just so busy. It was incredible. And you had to, you know, you, people would sandwich dates. You would, you would it, like accept on something, and and uh, then you would have to send a sub in to cover the first part of that date or the last part of the last one. It was just all day long. It was like this. Sometimes from eight in the morning until midnight. And uh, TV and film. And commercials and yeah, just everything. anything. Records. But I wound up that my, that my niche, they, they kind of put you where they want mm -hmm. you. And uh, my niche was live television. And uh, so I did uh, I did all the, uh, well, I did part of the Joy Bishop show, the Della Reese show, the Tony Orlando and Dawn show, uh, all the Chuck Barris things, the Gong show, the Dollar and Eve Beauty show, uh, Dinah Shore. I can't even think of all of them, but uh, uh, people used to put down live television because sometimes the music was so bad, you know. But then, and, and because you, well, no, not the music bad, but you just sat, you sat around all day long, you know. Like the Gong Show, we would rehearse maybe uh, 75 acts short, and then we would do five shows a day, five shows on Saturday and five shows on Sunday. Oh, God. Uh, <laughs> Uh, there was a lot of sitting around because they go so fast. You know, some of those people they just <laughs> throw them right off. But, <laughs> but, uh, but see, then, then you get residuals from that. The first rerun is seventy-five percent. Uh -huh. The next one's a little less, and so forth. Uh, ad infinitum. Uh, so I didn't see anything wrong. The only trouble is that lo there is no live television anymore, as yeah. you can see. There's uh, most everything is faded except film, mm -hmm. and the guys that that got into film and stayed with it are still working. Most of them. Mm -hmm. Film never appeared, appealed to me, really, because uh, I don't think you can have as much fun with film because it's too exact. You know, some of these...
people write things like, uh, well, I remember I went into to uh, uh, cover a date for Ted Nash, not young Ted, but his uncle. Oh. Uh, not the Ted Nash in New York, but his uncle, who was a tenor player before him. Okay. Uh, he became a uh, one of the first call lead players out here, which entails, you know, soprano, alto, pick, flute. Uh, alto flute, bass flute sometimes, uh, E flat clarinet, B flat clarinet, and sometimes bass clarinet. And uh, this day was at the old Columbia uh, Pictures Studio, which was on Sunset Boulevard in Gower. And I walked in there, and uh, they wanted him to stay to do this one take, and he did. And I thank God he did it because th there was nobody. I mean, it was just him all by himself, and he started on a high F on soprano, triple piano, just bang. And I, I realized then, I don't want to do that. <laughs> I really don't. I don't have the time. I don't have the time to keep that up on those horns to make it a, my life's work to do it. So well. I think I'll just, you know, and I, I feel that way today, too. I just, I don't want to do that kind of work. Uh -huh. It's too, uh, you know, you die. <laughs> God. That's high pressure. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's too much pressure for yeah. me. I don't, I don't care for it. Wow. But I got embroiled in that, and I, I'm glad I came back. But I, for that part of it, although it's it's died out now, but I, I do. Uh, I've always missed New York, and uh, every time I go back there, I take a, a nostalgia walk around and see where the old Birdman was, which is now a girly joint. Yeah. And uh, the Metropole is a girly joint, and uh, some of those places aren't even there anymore. The Five Spot. And, yeah. But uh, I think the thing that I really miss about New York is New York of the 60s, and not New York, especially the way it is now. Okay. Um. Well, I want to play a couple of things that you've played on, if you don't mind. And because uh, I think it's just going to be painful for me. No, I don't think it is. <laughs> I think they're pretty darn good myself. It's going to be Bill Berry at the Concord. It's a mouthful. Now that's that Marshall a... playing lead, you know. Uh-huh, yes. That, that was a good record. It really was a good uh -huh. record. Uh, I think one of the best parts about that record uh, is, was Richie Kamuka, uh -huh. who uh, I've, I've always been a big, big fan of Richie's, and of course Marshall too. And yeah. I think Blue was on that too, wasn't he? Didn't Blue do? Uh, wasn't Blue Mitchell on that? Actually, uh, this this recording is from. Um, I think it's a live. Yeah, it's called Hello Rev. Yeah, Hello Rev. Yeah, yeah but it's from it That's was right. done live at Concord. Yes. Yeah. 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 But it was a good band. But it was. What was Marshall Royal like? Was he a exacting straw boss? <laughs> well, he was a straw boss. You got that right. Uh, he was, uh, I don't know, I love Marshall. He was, Marshall was, uh, Marshall never really dictated. Marshall did it the way a, a real lead player should do it. And it's the way I've always advocated it is you don't, you shouldn't have to tell people anything. You just play it the way you want it, and they should follow you. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what he did. And everybody had enough respect for him that they they did it. You know, uh, I didn't. To be very honest with you, I didn't agree with everything Marshall played. Uh, I mean, that's not the way he played is not my style of playing. But and I didn't listen to him that much when I was a kid. I was listening to other people in a little. You know, like maybe Bud Shank at that time, or Vinnie Dean, or or uh, Lee Konis, that kind of thing they did with Stan, or even the tenor players with Woody's band. Uh -huh. But uh, uh, I, I knew what Marshall was and what he had done, and I certainly would have done anything he wanted me to do. You know, to play with him. Yeah. Uh, in that regard, and and we got we we were good friends, and we got along very well, and uh, uh, it was nice. It was a nice relationship. But he mm -hmm. didn't. He didn't. <laughs> I gotta tell you a funny story. Once, uh, when I was still on Maynard's band, this is about 1961. Uh, we were rehearsing. Used to rehearse at Birdland, and we Maynard called a four o'clock rehearsal. Well, Basie had called a one o'clock rehearsal. So <clears throat> I got there a little early, and Basie's band was still rehearsing. Well, uh, 
uh, Frank West was playing second alto then. I don't know if you remember that sure. con uh, configuration, but <clears throat> um, and I think it was Billy Mitchell and, and Frank Foster were playing the other two tenors. Mm -hmm. But uh, Frank West didn't show up, so Marshall said, you want to come over here and you know, play a couple tunes with us to finish out the rehearsal? I said, sure. So I went up and uh, played with him, and uh, we played through this thing that was sort of mediocre, and uh, uh, Ernie Wilkins had brought this chart in. Mm -hmm. Now, Ernie Wilkins is the one that wrote uh, her uh, Geller Cellar, which later became Morgan's Organ, that I recorded with Maynard's band. Oh. Uh, but uh, it was originally written for Herb Geller. But, but anyway, uh, we got through playing this, and, and Marshall looked at uh, Ernie, who was standing right in front of the band, and, and he said, Ernie, who wrote this piece of shit? <laughs> and Ernie says, what do you mean, Marshall? He said, I wrote it. What's wrong with it? Marshall said, Ernie, that's the worst piece of crap I ever heard, man. He said, who wrote this, Ernie? And Ernie said, I wrote it. Marshall says, I'd be goddamned if you wrote it. And he was like, that's the only time I ever heard him. Now, I never knew who did it, but I got a hunch Marshall was right. He, he didn't have time, and he farmed it out to somebody. Maybe he had a kid, one of his students or something, write it, and paid him a couple bucks and took it in. I'll be darned. But Marshall nailed him right away. And he would do that. He, uh, he became a little more mellow in his, in his uh, older years. <laughs> but he was a funny guy. And he always played, you know, he and Rabbit, used to, they used to play the same way. They played, they'd play with their eyes open. And they'd play something that was hot, you know, something that they thought would get all the, all the ladies and so forth. And then they'd go, they'd play, Dah! and they'd kind of look all around like this. You know, it's, it's really <laughs> wild. To watch. That's that school, you know. That's yeah, a, I can see Johnny Hodges doing that. I didn't know Marshall. Marshall did it, too. <laughs> it was very funny. I used, to, I used to watch him, and I wouldn't crack up, but I would inside. <laughs> Hey, I'll have to try that someday. But he's, you know, he's, uh, you know, I play lead sometimes with Bill's band when I can be here now. And I, I've told Bill in front, I wouldn't try and, uh, I wouldn't even try to play those things the way Marshall did. Mm -hmm. It's a whole different style. You know, he played Warm Valley and, uh, uh, oh, the thing we're going to play tonight, Est Estefan, Estef, I can't. E east, not East of. Ish Oh, it's oh. a thing written for Johnny Hodges, you know, actually. Uh, but all those things that are, that are synonymous with, uh, with either Johnny Hodges or Marshall, like, there's no point in anyone trying to do that. I, yeah. That's not the way I feel them. Mm -hmm. And even if I, I mean, I can get them off reasonably well, but it's still not the same thing. Yeah. So I don't remember the question you asked. Oh, you asked me about Marshall. Right. He was a great guy. He yeah. really was a great yeah. guy. Yeah. Okay, one more. Um, a little finger buster here. Oh, it's Coco. Super sad. <laughs> I mean, that's impossible. <laughs> you know which album those are from? Yeah. Which one? L.A. Voices, uh, okay. number three. Oh, this is where Med sings. Does Med sing on this? I, yeah, I don't think I got that part. That is just, I mean, outrageous. It is. I'll tell you, the, the, uh, of course, Matt always wants to kill me. Matt or Nimitz want to kill me when I, I say this, but, uh, the, the lead part and the baritone part are the easiest parts. <laughs> the inner, the, the, sure. the alto, second alto and the two tenor parts are, are just a bear. Had I known you were going to do that, I would have brought you a copy of the, uh, second alto part. I'd love to see it. In fact, maybe I'll send it to you. Great. Because uh, I know what you're saying, because, all those lower harmonies and stuff, and, and when they write the arrangements, they're not necessarily taken into account. Med does. Med does all the writing. Uh -huh. he, well, he did. Buddy Clark did some, and uh, Warren Marsh did some. Uh, Med, Med never writes a repeated note, uh, and he, he for some reason he doesn't he doesn't use too many scales. I don't know why he didn't do that hmm. because they're usually kind of easy to to voice and to play on. Oh, yeah. But I mean, or too many chords. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, 
uh, even even with that, I mean, in other words, if, if he's going to, he'll cross voice if he has to repeat it rather than repeat a note. He'll, oh. Uh, but they're, uh, they're, they're still hard. They're really hard. How much time would you have to get that ready? Well, they, you know, there's, before Super, I wasn't on the original Super Saints. Mm -hmm. uh, it was Bill Perkins first and then Joe Lopes for the first couple of years. They spent a year rehearsing in Perk's garage before they even ventured outside. Uh, but see, see, the band doesn't work anymore. That's the trouble. Yeah. So, so Med's got a uh, Med's got a band, a big band with the uh, eight, seven or eight brass and the saxes, super sax in front, and then the LA voices too. Well, that's like a 19-piece band, you know. And you can't. Okay. It's hard to even book a trio in this town, let alone a 19-piece uh -huh. band. So he's put all his effort uh, into that for the last several years. Uh, and as a result, Super Sax is not working, not doing anything. Uh, if, when we were working quite a bit, even, even three or four times a month, this stuff was easy. But, I mean, it was not easy, but it was everyone had it under their fingers, even the inner parts. But, but you know, we'll get a gig now, and Metal Call maybe a three-hour rehearsal, and we go over some of these things. But you can't begin to get yeah. all those things. No. I mean, it's not only this. There's, uh, there's a whole host of those things, you know, that are that are really very difficult. Even the slow ones are hard. Even what? Even the slow ones. Uh huh. Some of the ballads, Lover Man is is uh, impossible only because the saxes have to lay behind the the time so far, like Bird did. Uh, Embraceable You. Yeah, so it's not just a finger thing; it's a whole concept. It's of a whole concept. The time. Yeah. And if you don't know Bird, it's just you know you really have to know Bird to play that. You have to know the way he played it. Uh huh. Could you pick out uh, of the things you've made as your recollection of a personal favorite solo or or a recording that you really are glad you did? Of my own or with a band? Yeah, of your own. Uh, well, I've got a couple things out with a quartet that I like. Mm -hmm. uh, one of them's on VSOP, it's just called the Landing Organ Quartet. Mm -hmm. And the other one's after that, and it's on Contemporary, and it's called uh, Pacific Standard. Uh, I like those two. Uh, some of the things with the, with the big band, uh, uh, I like the thing we did called Tinsel with Maynard's band. That, Willie, that was Willie's favorite thing that he ever wrote, mm -hmm. I think. And it was, it's a ballad. Uh, it's, I think I just play a chorus or two of, the, of a kind of altered blues thing, but mm -hmm. I just I just kind of like the way that yeah. hung together. I wanted to read something. Um, these are two different quotes about you, and they, it caught my eye because uh, one is from the Grove Encyclopedia Jazz, and I uh, said, talking about you, and then, he has few peers on Cherokee. And then there's another thing from another book about recordings is Cherokee is a song he practically owns. What's this thing with Cherokee now? Well, you know, <laughs> uh, when I was coming up, Cherokee was a was a uh, something you had to conquer, much like, uh, oh, you know, uh, God, now my memory's leaving me. I'm having a senior moment. Uh, no, you know, the, uh, Giant Steps, most like Giant yeah. Steps was uh, a couple decade, decades later. Mm -hmm. uh, there are t tunes like that floating around, like uh, Cherokee, Giant Steps, uh, Stella by Starlight, uh, things that have a lot of changes and move around. Uh, so I worked hard on that, and I've recorded, I recorded it first with Maynard on the, the new sounds of Maynard Ferguson, and then I recorded it probably three times on my own, not all of them intentional. I recorded Coco on an album I did for uh, Palo Alto Records, uh, and uh, I recorded Cherokee on that VSOP album. And then I just did a one that's supposed to have come out on that Fresh Sounds, that Spanish label, oh, great. Uh, label. that's uh, called uh, A Suite for Yardbird. They're all bird tunes. And I did uh, Coco again because the producer wanted me to do it. So who am I to argue with the producer? Mm -hmm. So I did it. Um, so I guess I played it so much. I, I don't really claim to be the master of Cherokee. There's a lot of people that, I mean, anybody who's proficient on the horn plays it well, usually. But uh -huh. I think he meant, uh, I, I think one of those Scots was from, uh, one of those quotes was from Scott Yanow, 
Yeah. Uh, but uh, it's just a tune I played a lot, I think. Yeah. Well, he caught his ear anyway. Well, yeah. whatever it takes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's the in the near future for you, besides you playing with uh, Bill Berry tonight? Well, you know, I've, I've been traveling with Natalie Cole for the last six and a half years. Yeah. So, uh, in fact, we just got back from the East Coast with her a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I'm going to uh, Elmhurst College around Chicago mm -hmm. uh, to do a jazz weekend. Uh, Micah Benny and myself and Bobby Shu and Maynard and the band are is going to be there too. Uh, so that's uh, from the 25th of this month through the end of the month. And then she has some things uh, throughout the year. Uh, one of them will be in Brazil, I think, for about three weeks. Uh, going to England uh, in April with uh, a small group. Uh, you know Vic Lewis? Have you ever heard of Vic Lewis? I guess I have it. Vic had a big band in London, and now he's sort of an entrepreneur. Uh, he's bringing this small group over. With, this will be, oh, let's see, Pete, Pete Chrisley, Bill Perkins, myself, Carl Saunders, uh, Ron Stout, uh, Andy, oh, don't tell me, don't do this, Lenny, uh, trombone player, wonderful trombone player, Martin, Andy Martin, mm -hmm. young guy. Um, have you heard of any of those people? Some of them. Okay. Pete Chrisley, for sure. Okay. <laughs> so we're going to do one night in London with a small band and the, the next night with Bill Holman's band. He's going to use us who are in the band anyway and uh, supplement it with English players. Yeah. And then he's going, uh, Phil Woods did a tour with a big band in uh, starting in Spain uh, for a guy named Jordi Pujol, who's a, a booker over there. He was a friend of J Jordi Sunyol, who has Fresh Sounds Records. I may have those last names mixed uh -huh. up, but uh, anyway, we've got about five or six dates with uh, with Bill's band over there. Uh, uh, I think the North Sea Festival and, and a couple dates in Portugal and things like that. And also, I have a few things of my own too that I've some yeah. involved traveling and somewhere in town. You do your own booking, your own business. Yeah, my wife helps me with that. My wife's a publicist. Uh huh. And uh, that she, helps. she helps me when she can with that. But it's, it's very difficult. You really, I think you really need, uh, you know, you really need a high-powered booking agent. It's like when Maynard started, uh, uh, he had uh, Joe Glazer from ABC Booking. Mm -hmm. And uh, the way Maynard got started was uh, that uh, Joe would call these people and say, uh, uh, you want Miles in there for a couple of weeks? And they'd say, yeah, I'd love to have him. Well, how about Maynard Ferguson? He'd say, no, never heard of him. And Joe would say, if you want Miles, you'll take Maynard, too. And they got him. Of course, Joe, a lot of these bookers also were capable of putting people face down in the local river if they had to, too. That was kind of a holdover from the Depression, I think. But, uh, yeah. It's a whole different book. But now, you, there's so many people that want to that wanna work, uh, that want to do things. And, and you know, if you look, uh, you being a saxophone player and a musician, if you, if you look out there, you can see that there's some of them deserve to be working and some of them don't. Yeah. It's a crapshoot, really, and it's, mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not so much, uh, uh, you know, gee, I play good, I want to work a lot or I want to record a lot. It's, it's, uh, a lot has to do with this and who you know and so forth. So right. It's just the way it is. Yeah. Well, it's been a pleasure talking with you. It's been my pleasure, and I'm sure you found out that I'm a real motor mouth once you get me. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but it has been. I've enjoyed it. I appreciate good. you having me. I'm looking forward to hearing the band tonight. and. Best of luck in your travels. Thank you. Thanks. Right. Take care. Hope we see each other again. All right.